Hi, dear. Welcome to today's online class on soilless farming. Uh, we will start off while we wait for others to join. I am Yang. I can't see the name well. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. So we'll be starting off right away so that we do not have to waste time. We will be starting off 7 o'clock. It's already 7 a.m. by my time. So we'll be starting off right away. So the first thing is, I hope we can see the poll. Soilless farm. Soilless farm. So definitely, I would not have to explain what farming is. I'm sure we all know the meaning of farming. The key word here is the word soilless. Planting without the use of soil. That is the key word, planting without the use of soil. And for us to understand how we plant without the use of soil, it is important we understand what the function of soil is in itself. So we realize that soil in itself has three functions. Soil in itself has three functions. One, soil is meant to give support to the plants. So one of the functions of soil is to help give support to the plants. The second function of soil is to help in plant aeration. So to provide air for the plant. So remember that when we talk about the plant, the plant has the shoot and the roots. Now, the roots part of the plant, most people do not know that it also requires air. So one of the functions of soil is to help in aeration. And the third function of the soil is to help in water retention is to help in water retention. So I think that it can be so clear on the board. I said soil has three functions. One is to support the plants, to give support to the plants. Two is to help in aeration. Three, to help in water retention for the ability of the plants, of the soil to retain water. Now you take note of the fact that I did not say one of the function of soil is to provide nutrients. No, because nutrient is dependent on the availability of decaying matter or decaying organic matter and minerals in that environment. That is what determines nutrient. So what I'm saying is, if this is a land, if this is regular land, this is soil and all of that, if here we have decaying matter plus minerals, deposited in this part of the land why here there is no there are no minerals or decaying materials in this part of the land we would say there is a probability that this part of the land is what we would call the fertile land so it is not that it is the soil in itself that determines the minerals that are deposited here neither it is the soil in itself that determines the decaying materials that are there however even if we have decayed materials here and minerals here and those decayed materials and minerals are not soluble in water the plant cannot use it it will become inaccessible to the plant so it is important that whatever nutrients you have in the soil must be soluble in water so that the plant can access it two so you realize it is also important that the soil is able to hold the water because if the soil cannot hold water, if it cannot retain water, then the plant also would not survive. However, you realize from our basic understanding, we know we have three basic types of soil. We have sandy, we have clay, and we have loamy. Now you realize that your sandy soil cannot support plants, if we look at the characteristics of soil, Sandy soil will allow for aeration, but sandy soil cannot allow for water retention, which is why we don't really use sandy soil for growing. We do not really use sandy soil for so much growing. When you come to clay soil, clay soil can support the plant properly, but clay soil is not going to allow for aeration, though clay soil will allow for water retention, which explains why. Clay soil is not perfect 
for growing. I hope we are together. Then on the final note, we have loamy soil. Loamy soil can support the plants. Loamy soil will allow for aeration, for air to enter uh, the roots of the plants. And loamy soil can retain water moderately. Now, once, because of that, this is why we use loamy soil for growing. I hope this makes sense. Now, once we understand this, soilless farming in the simplest form is we are looking for a substitute for loamy soil. What is that thing that can perform the function of loamy soil but yet it is not soil? That is the foundation of soilless farming. Anything that can perform the function of loamy soil yet it is not soil. So that is one thing we should put in mind, the foundation. Now, just like loamy soil, there are some parameters we also look at. Which means what I'm saying is, it is not just something that can perform support, aeration, and retain water. There are other things that we are concerned about, such as what is the pH of the material you are going to be using? Meaning, how acidic or how alkaline is that material you want to use as a substitute? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this um, early morning. I appreciate and value your time. So what is the pH of the material you want to use? It is very important. So we'll take examples of um, materials that can replace loamy soil. Remember we said that when it comes to soilless farming, good morning, go green, good morning, sir. Remember I said that when it comes to soilless farming, now we started by explaining what soilless farming means. And I said, in soilless farming, since we understand the function of soil, what we want to figure out is what can perform this function of soil. Simple. So we have examples. I will take examples from things that we have around us that are readily relatable. So we have an example. We have sawdust as an example. You know sawdust, that thing that they bring out from wood in um, all these uh, um, carpenter milling shop. Oh, that, that's not the right name, I can't remember what they call them now. But the sawdust. So we can use sawdust as a way to perform soilless farming. As there is a farm uh, in Uganda where we use the sawdust to grow pineapple. So you can use sawdust. Sawdust can support the plants. Sawdust can help in aeration. Sawdust can help in water retention. Then somebody would ask, is sawdust very okay? I mean, is it any wood you can use from saw? Is it any kind of wood you can use, you can collect sawdust from? Yes, but, but, you see, you need to be careful to ensure that the sawdust that you are collecting to use does not have any infection. When I say infection, you know that there are some wood when you get to carpenter's shop, is as if uh, fungi or some bacteria or some pathogens are eating up the, the wood itself. So if you notice that it is that kind of wood, then you don't want to use it. Why? If you use a sawdust that is already contaminated, you have automatically introduced your plants to a contaminated environment. And that will increase the probability of the plants getting infected. So somebody may then ask, if this is the case, how do I know whether the sawdust is infected or not? Or is there a way to safeguard using infected um, sawdust? Yes. So all you need to do is, when you pack your sawdust, you will do what we call carbonating. You do carbonating. Carbonating is quite simple. In simple English word, carbonating is burning. How do we burn? You can get like a very big drum steel drum obviously pour the sawdust inside and put fire you are not pouring water inside it you are sterilizing you are carbonating you keep burning until you notice that it has become totally black or dark once it is dark it is now carbonated sawdust in that way whatever pathogens was in the parent wood would not be transferred to your plant because heat by default we know from um, elementary science that you can use heat to do sterilization. 
So this is an example of what we can use. Another example of what we can use for soilless farming is rice hulls. Now, the rice that we eat at home does not come like that from the plants. It comes inside something like a shaft. So, if you get that shaft, you can use the shaft from rice to also grow soilless. Again, if you get rice oil, you are going to notice something peculiar about rice oil. The water retention ability of rice oil is quite low. So what we also do again is carbonate the rice oil, it will increase its water retention ability. It will retain, it will increase. Why post? I'm sorry, I don't know. Is it post? Somebody is complaining that it is post. Please confirm if it is post on everybody's end. Somebody is complaining that the video is post. So, rice hull. So, like I said earlier, I said with rice hull, you are, um, you also carbonate. This is another thing that you can use, and you would also get the same results. Another thing again that you can use is charcoal. You see, these are things we have around us. If you go to Abakaliki area, Abakaliki, you have so much um, rice hull in Abakaliki, they even throw them away until we got there and real. they saw us packing and they understood what we are using them for. So there's a little feed you put on it, but still not so much. Then, charcoal. You can also use charcoal for uh, growing without soil. However, the issue, the little issue with charcoal is Charcoal is a compound that likes to compete with the plant for the nutrients you are putting in the water. Okay, it is called, um, I don't know if we are back live, but a call came in. Um, please, just a minute, let me see if I can go off, if I can cancel my... Okay, let me just leave it. Okay, let me come back. I hope we are good. I'm sorry, the call came in. No, it is called rice hull. It is bean husk. The actual, the correct name is supposed to be rice hull, although most time people just call it rice husk. But it's still the same thing we are talking about, rice hull. It is not actually called a husk, but people, some people call it husk. So I said charcoal, I said, so the disadvantage or the issue with charcoal is charcoal is going to compete with your plant for the available nutrient, which means that until the charcoal is super saturated, your plant may not have access to the nutrients that you are giving to them. However, you can put a little bit of charcoal with any of these other substrates, you will get what you want. Then the next one is what we call cocoa, okay, let me write it, coconut fiber. So, for those of us that are probably, uh, that have had the privilege of growing up in the village, you would know that the coconut that we buy in the market, you know it's something usually uh, very small like that, usually something small like that. But in the farm, how you get it, it does not come this small, it comes in a bigger pod. So, coconut actually comes in a bigger pod. Now, between this external uh, surface or pericarp of the pod, there are a lot of fibers that look like sponge. There are a lot of fibers. These fibers here can also be used for growing. Those fibers there can also be used for growing. All we need to do is, when you get these fibers out, yeah, they do this somewhere, they do it in Calapam, Akwai Bomb, they have it in Abundance, in Cross River, they have it in the Kwe Badagri region. Once you get these fibers out, all you need to do is, these fibers by default are a bit acidic, by default. So what we do is, soak it inside water. Soak inside water, change the water, do that continuously for like maybe two, three days soak in water, leave it for about 8 to 12 hours, change the water until your fiber assumes the pH of the water. Once you have done that, grind the, uh, the, the coconut fiber. Once you grind the coconut fiber, 
you can use that to grow perfectly. I should take that post again. I'm sorry, please check. I think it should be on post. A call came in, but I've ended the call. Now, that coconut fiber, when it is finally processed, it is what you see that is referred to as cocoa koi or cocoa pits. So when it is processed, that is what is called cocoa koi or cocoa pits. So an example, this is a processed cocoa fiber that has already been turned into a block by dehydrating it. So if I want to use this, we'll try to do the uh, experiment later or the practical, I think that's the right word. We'll throw it inside water and you are going to see it swell. I'm trying to be a bit fast so that we can cover everything. Now, you realize all of these that I have explained, these are locally available materials. I am trying not to bother you with materials that you cannot readily access. I don't want to bother you with materials you cannot readily access. There is another one, number five, called pit moss. Now, to know what pit moss is, when you travel, if you are in Lagos, I'll uh, probably use Lagos because that's where I'm a bit familiar with, and you are moving from the mainland to the island through the Todd Mainland Bridge, you will see some plants growing on the water, some plants growing on top of the river. Now, most of these plants are called, um, I think, bryophyta, if I'm not wrong, because they don't have true root, true leaves, or true stems. Now, when they gather them together, if you gather them together, you can dry them, grind them. When blended together, it is called pit moss. You can also use them for growing. Now, what do all of these things have in common? Number one, they all have a neutral pH. Very important. They all have a neutral pH, pH of seven. Now, the advantage of having a pH of seven is it means that you can actually determine what you want to put in one, two, you can determine the level of acidity or alkalinity based on the nutrients you are bringing in based on the need of your plant. Meaning, if your plant requires as an acidic environment, you can make it move from pH 7 to below. If your plant requires an alkaline environment to grow, you can go from pH 7 and above. And if your plant requires a neutral pH to grow, then the plant, the, the substrate is already at that neutral pH. I hope that makes sense. So you realize soilless growing is simple. Now we look at what are the types of soilless growing available. What are the types of soilless growing available? I would hope that after this class, we are going to try something out. So I'm going to give very little um, questions that I know that we can try out and I will put a prize on it for the first person to get it correctly. So um, the types that we have available, we have two basic types. We have hydroponics and aquaponics. So the two basic types of soilless system we have, hydroponics and aquaponics. Now, in hydroponics, the word hydro, the word hydro means water. Hydro means water. The word ponics means labor, which means hydroponics is basically laboring in water. If you want to go with a um, Literal things. Now, in hydroponics, we are growing plants within a liquid medium. However, let me put this clearly. In hydroponics, again, we have two types. We have the substrate-based hydroponics and the non-substrate-based hydroponics. Substrate-based hydroponics, if you remember, Earlier, I listed the different types of substrates we can use to replace loamy soil. Now, if you take a container, for example, if you can see this. Now, what I have inside here is peat moss. What I have inside here is peat moss. These are plants growing 
inside the pit mass. So in this case, what I am performing here is substrate-based hydroponics. I don't know if that makes sense. So for most commercial farmers, they usually go for the substrate-based hydroponics. They feel it is easier to manage, it is easier to monitor temperature and all of the other things. Then you can also decide and say, no, I don't want to do substrate-based hydroponics. I want to go for non-substrate-based hydroponics. In non-substrate-based hydroponics, it means you are going to be growing your plant inside water. You are going to be growing your plant inside water only. That, when we say water, now, which means water with nutrients inside. It is either that, um, uh, what is it called now? It is either you have it in the form where, if this is my water, it is either you have the plant inside the water permanently, meaning the water is not moving, you have the plant inside water, we call that deep water culture, or you could have a system where the water keeps running and coming back from the reservoir, the water keeps going and coming back from the reservoir, we call that the nutrient film technique, or you could have a method where you have the roots of the plant suspended in air and the water sprays to the roots in form of a mist intermittently, we call that aeroponics. Then you could also have it in the form where you have the plant in water. However, the plants are moving because what you use as a support system keeps moving up and down. We call that the floating or raft system. Again, I am trying not to go to uh, detail. I just want to give you something you can start at home. So the first assignment you are going to try to do is, one, try and find any of the substrates. Try to find any of the substrate, which is either you are getting sawdust, cocoa coal, it has a coconut fiber, or peat moss, or rice hull, any of the substrate that you can lay your hands on first. That is number one. Try and find any or get any of the substrate. You can put any, use any container to grow. If what you want to use is a regular small plastic container, put holes at the bottom so that the excess water has a place to run out. Okay, so that is on hydroponics. In aquaponics, what we have is you connect the system. So instead of just having your nutrients inside here, next year you are going to have fish instead. So instead of, <coughs> excuse me, we are going to have fishes instead, such that the waste product of the fish becomes the nutrient for the plants. Take that again. In aquaponics, you are doing adding aquaculture with hydroponics together in one system. So that the waste product of the fish, we know that I don't know if you can see me, if you can hear me. 